People probably have heard of Bourbaki, this uh, group of mathematicians uh, that came together in France uh, to kind of rewrite the foundations of mathematics. I remember being rather blown away when I went into the library and seeing all of these books by this one mathematician, Bourbaki, kind of freaked me out. And I was quite pleased to discover, oh, no, this is a group of mathematicians writing all of these. But there was actually another interesting group in France that sort of, was in, sort of inspired by the Bourbaki, which were called the Oulipo movement. Oulipo stands for something in French, which is about work for the potential of literature. It was a group of mathematicians and writers that were exploring how mathematics might be used to, to generate literature. Almost, uh, you know, if you're stuck and you don't know what to do, perhaps you can use mathematics as kind of shortcut to start generating um, interesting new ideas. One of the leaders of that group was a guy called Quinault, who was kind of amateur mathematician, interested in the Bourbaki group, but was really a poet. And he came up with uh, an incredibly beautiful way to be highly productive. In fact, he ended up uh, being able to write a hundred thousand billion sonnets by tapping into a mathematical shortcut. So how did he do this? Well, remember, a sonnet is a poem which has 14 lines, has a particular uh, rhyming structure and rhythm structure to it as well. Um, so what he did, he decided to write uh, 10 lines that you could choose one of those 10 lines to be the first line of your sonnet. Um, then he wrote uh, another 10 lines which you could choose to be the second line of your sonnet. So basically he had 14 lines that he needed to write, but each line there were 10 choices. Okay, so there are 10 choices for each line, 14 lines, that means there are 10 to the 14 possible sonnets that you could, could write. Um, so just by writing 140 lines, but using this mathematical idea of randomly choosing a line, uh, the permutations that were possible meant with just a very small amount of work, plus a bit of mathematics, he managed to write a hundred thousand billion, I think that's 10 to the 14, different sonnets. They're not written down anywhere though. They can't be. All of them are not written down. In fact, I did a little calculation to work out, okay, if you said, I think you probably say one of these sonnets in a minute, we could test that a little later. I worked out if the first Diplodocus that have ever evolved started reciting these sonnets that by now that Diplodocus might have finished the whole lot. So we're talking a, a, a lot of sonnets. You know, you might say, well, that, that doesn't require any creativity at all. No, the creativity is actually writing lines of poetry that um, whichever one you choose to follow next, it sort of makes some sense. Um, so I don't know, we could have a go at um, uh, doing, so I, I've got um, from one, this is the first line, and I've got 10 different lines here. Um, so you, why don't we generate a, a Quino sonnet? And the interesting thing is the probability is that this will be the first time, this will be in the inaugural event of, of this particular sonnet. So, so you give me um, a number and I will choose that particular line for our first line. I would like you to go through the stack there and do Set the seventh, the eighth, the seventh, the eighth, all the way through the stack. Okay, let's go for that. So, here it goes like this. Yet Rose took the minstrel's verse without a squeeze. Licks round carved marble chops on snails full blown. The understanding critic firstly sees. While sharks to let's say potted shrimps are prone. They both are right not untamed mutterings. Nought can the mouse's timid nibbling stave. They both are right, not unformed smatterings. Filching the lolly country thrift helped save. Poetic license needs no strain or stress. A bird brain banquet melts bold mistress Mog. From cool Parnassus down to wild Loch Ness. Whiskey will always wake an Irish bog. Ventriloquists be blowed, you strike be dumb. Fried grilled black puddings, still the world's best yum. Kind of curious. I'm not sure I, I, I understood quite what was going on there. Um, but you could certainly hear the sonnet's structure, the rhyming structure. So he made sure that the lines he chose. Um, uh, and I think the challenge was 
yeah, very often we get stuck in a rut and we sort of write things that we've heard before, um, ideas that are old and a bit hackneyed. And I think their thought with using mathematics as a, as a way to kind of push us into something at, at first reading, I'm not sure I made much sense of that, but maybe we sit with it a bit and it takes us somewhere new. Maybe we won't end with that, but maybe that's a beginning to stimulate us to take us somewhere new. And I think that was their idea to use mathematics to generate things that maybe we we wouldn't come across if we didn't use the mathematics. Yeah. I mean, these days we have tweet bots and things, don't we, that make up tweets and things like that using picking from lists and things like this. I mean, these were pioneers, I guess, of that. Yeah, I think they were pioneers. And, you know, they came up with different strategies. Um, another one I particularly like, um, which makes you hear an old poem in a new way, was something they called N plus seven. So N stands for noun in this. You know, it's already an equation. We've got N plus seven. N is a noun. And what it asks you to do is to take a poem you know, but just to shift every noun in that poem seven along in the dictionary. So, for example, to be or not to be, that is the question. Well, question in is a noun. So if I apply N plus seven to that, I get to be or not to be. That is the quiche. Now, that kind of, uh, there's a combination of, of, of things I know and then a surprise in there. And it's kind of absurd. Um, but I think it it's interesting because it helps you to hear the structure, but perhaps takes away meaning. Um, I, I've got another example of that, actually. Uh, let me try and find that um, in here. Uh, I want to go yeah. through every poem I know now and do that and reply that. <laughs> well, it, it helps you to hear the poem in a new way. And then when you go back to it, maybe it sort of helps you read the old poetry in a new way. So, uh, so here's an old poem, probably recognise this. It's a poem by Blake. To see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. I always like that one because it's got a bit of mathematics already in it. Um, but let's apply n plus seven to that. To see a worm in a grampus of sandblast and a hebe in a wild flu. Hold inflow in the palmsy of your hanger and ethos in a housefly. Now that, that is kind of curious. Um, but you can hear the, the same underlying poem there, but just something very new emerging out of there. Um, so I think some of these, you might say, well, you know, it needs a little bit more of human creativity in it. But I think these are meant to be jumping off points to, to make you think in new ways. And, and I, uh, very exciting, this kind of Ulipo movement that they were just looking at mathematical structures. How could they be used as a kind of shortcut either to generating huge number of poems or, or thinking about poems in a new way? Um, and there's uh, another one which, uh, not poetry, which somehow already has a mathematical character to it, but um, a, a novel, which is using a really intriguing piece of mathematics. Uh, Georges Perec was a member of the Ulipo movement. People might know a book that he wrote which tried to avoid the letter E. Kind of a challenge to translate because it was in French and then to translate it into English, you know, the translator's got to do a lot of work. But he also wrote another book called Life a User's Manual. And this is an interesting book to use the structure of a Latin Greco um, square. I mean, they're a bit like Sudokus. And they're called Latin Greco squares because the idea is, can I put Latin letters and Greek letters such that, uh, you know, say four Latin letters, four Greek letters, can I arrange those such so that there's one of each Latin and Greek in each square, but you get no repeats on, on columns and rows. And one of the challenges was, well, can you do a five by five, six by six, seven by seven? And it turns out, I think, if I remember rightly, that you can't do six by six, but you can do a 10 by 10. And it was discovered how to do that. And Perec took this Latin Greco square, 10 by 10, and used it as the structure for a book with, well, actually not a hundred chapters, because each box was going to be a chapter. He chooses 99, so there's one, of the squares missing rather provocatively. And he puts uh, not Latin and Greek letters, but uh, lots of different ideas, 10 of this thing and 10 of that thing, puts them in all of the boxes in a way that no box in a row or a column will have a repeat. And then he uses 
again another mathematical idea, the knight's move to move through all of these rooms. And then he sets himself the condition he's got to write a chapter involving all the things that are in that room that he's put using the, the 10 by 10 Latin Greco square. So again, his mathematics being used as a, a structure and a constraint in order to be able to push him into being uh, inventive in a, in a way that he might not have considered before. So I think that's what's interesting, using mathematics to push you into new realms, sometimes generating new things, sometimes restricting you, and using that you find yourself discovering literature that you never would have thought of doing before. Professor, you're a mathematician, and I know you also like music and the arts and things like that. Have you ever used your own mathematics to create some kind of constraint on any art you were creating? I actually, in music, I have done. I, I worked with a composer uh, and we wrote this quartet together, which was the idea that I thought mathematical proof was a bit like writing a piece of music. What I did was to explain to Emily Howard, this composer, four of my favorite proofs from the ancient Greeks. And then she used those as a constraint for our own musical journeys. We ended up writing this string quartet called Four Musical Proofs and a Conjecture, which used sort of the constraint of uh, uh, the logical journey of a mathematical proof uh, as, as a way of inspiring new music. A lot of this stuff that you've shared with me in this video like, is fun, but it does say, you use the word absurd, which I think is a good word for it. Like, do you think this is like, silliness is this doing a good service to the art or is this like are people going to watch this video and think what a load of nonsense uh, well i i do think the ulipomo movement has, has certainly um had those criticisms leveled at them and i think uh sometimes the things just generate perhaps that sonnet you felt was completely meaningless but every now and again maybe it helps you to, to, to discover a real gem and i think if you look at people who use those kind of ideas of mathematical structures as an inspiration, you realise that it can be sometimes very profitable. I mean, take Calvino, Italian novelist, who used a lot of these kind of generative ideas. He wrote a, a lovely book called Cosmic Comics, which I recommend any scientist to read because they're full of wonderful little scientific ideas to create literature. You know, he's a, a great novelist, but he used mathematics as an inspiration for a, a lot of his ideas. The other one I would suggest is Borges, Borges, he's one of my literary heroes, and he used lovely ideas of mathematics. For example, the Library of Babel is a story, short story, 10 pages. It makes this library that actually when you explore the library through the literature, through the story, you realise that what Borges has created is a folded up library that has three different directions you can go in, you know, along a floor, but up the floors as well. And he connects them all together. When you connect these these floors and rooms together, the shape of this library is actually the surface of a four dimensional torus. He wanted to explore these mathematical ideas um, using his own language of storytelling. Sometimes it doesn't produce something uh, which is interesting, but every now and again, you get a gem which comes out of this. One last question, Professor. You've talked a bit about how the arts borrow from mathematics and can benefit from it and it can help get through writer's block. Does it ever go the other way? Does, does mathematics ever benefit from art? Yeah, I think that's a real challenge. And I think, you know, I, I'm, I talk a lot to different artists uh, from different disciplines, music, literature, theatre, um, and I'm always looking for something interesting which has started in the arts and then stimulate something mathematically. Actually, uh, the Fibonacci numbers are numbers which were first discovered by poets and musicians uh, because the Fibonacci numbers count the number of rhythms you can make with long and short beats. So a poet that wanted to create um, a poem with long and short beats actually uh, discovered these Fibonacci numbers. So there's an interesting sort of different direction, rather unexpected. But I actually have been inspired to look at a new mathematical structure in my kind of own area of research, which was stimulated by uh, listening to a piece of music that was exploring the symmetries of the cube combined with a Fibonacci kind of uh, sequence, sort of it was doing symmetries, but using a Fibonacci rule to generate the next symmetry. And I'd never seen that before, a combination of Fibonacci and symmetry. And so that piece of music, seeing this composer, Zanarchus, use that, has actually set me off on a journey saying, well, what about other 
symmetrical structures and if you do this Fibonacci rule, are there new things you can discover? So my own research has actually benefited from, uh, from exploration by a musician about uh, kind of mathematical ideas. You know, maybe you've written millions of poems, or if you're like me, you've made what feels like millions of videos. One thing for sure is you don't want to lose all that stuff to a computer failure, or maybe something even worse. A backup at home just isn't going to cut it. You need a backup in the cloud, and for that, I use Backblaze. Easy to use, great value for money. You know, nothing gives me more peace of mind than seeing this little icon in the top right corner of my screen, knowing all my files have been constantly updated and backed up to the cloud. If the worst does happen, don't worry, you can then get all your stuff back from the cloud, or if it's a lot, maybe you can have it sent by post on a hard drive. You can also access any file anytime from, say, your mobile phone, which is a feature I have found very handy from time to time. Go to backblaze.com slash number file to check them out. They have a free 15-day trial with no strings attached, so it can't hurt to have a look. Backblaze.com slash number file. There'll be a link in the video description. Please. While sharks to let's say potted shrimps are prone, to one sweet hour of bliss my memory clings. Filching the lolly country thrift held save. He's gone to London, how the echo rings.